Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amira Rashad. I am co-founder and CEO of uh, BulkWiz. We're a, an online e-commerce bulk value uh, platform powered by homegrown AI. I'm here to host uh, this panel with uh, a very rich uh, um, sort of group of experts here. But uh, let me, before introducing them, kind of set the, uh, the scene. Um, the World Bank has issued a report saying that by 2050, there will be 10 billion people on this planet. Guess what? We're going to have to feed those guys. Not only do we have to feed them, we have to feed them while we handle uh, issues like uh, limited resources or diminishing resources, like water, for example, um, environmental issues, um, economic issues related to how our supply chain works, as well as changing consumer habits uh, across the world. The panel here is uh, involved and has already started to address some of these problems and get us to a situation where we're actually able to tackle that problem. Uh, to my left, we have um, Simon Hopkins, who is CEO of Miltrust. Uh, we have Faisal Hamadi, who is founder and uh, CEO of Jakob. And we have Sky Kurtz, who is co-founder and CEO of Pure Harvest. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, I would like to have you each uh, introduce uh, yourselves do, and tell us what exactly you do in order to address that big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, goal of uh, feeding those 10 billion people. Sure. Can we start with Sky? Certainly. So Pure Harvest uh, is leading the way in bringing the Middle East into the next generation of agriculture. Uh, we are using technology to control the climate inside very high-tech uh, climate-controlled greenhouses that enable us to have year-round locally grown fresh produce anywhere. And we've uh, built a very large facility here in the UAE as a proof of concept that has operated now through two summers perfectly controlling and, and emulating a Mediterranean climate on the inside of the greenhouse. And what's a bit counterintuitive is that once you control for climate, the Middle East is one of the greatest places in the world to farm. We have an abundance of light, cheap and abundant land, cheap and abundant energy infrastructure, CO2, we're one of the hydrocarbon capitals of the world, low taxes. So fundamentally farming here, we are working to prove can be incredibly competitive and that we can help to solve that food security, water conservation, and economic diversification challenge that this region is facing. And from our side, we complement what Sky is doing in terms of the value chain of food. We're more towards the consumer side. We're a food tech company that aims to improve the nutrition of uh, school canteens uh, because we see there's a lot of wastage when it comes to um, the supply and demand and when it comes to, to canteens and schools. And our goal is to improve the nutrition of the next generation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Simon Hopkins. Um, I'm the chief executive of a company called Mill Trust. We're based out of Singapore. Um, we're, we are primarily an emerging markets investor, investing into 72, uh, 32 different uh, economies around the world, developing countries around the world. Um, 10 years ago, we got into the realm of sustainable farming, and we built a program for institutional investors to deploy capital into uh, farming uh, large-scale farming around the world on a sustainable basis. So today, we've built a business which is the second largest producer of milk solids in New Zealand. It, we don't do any intensive farming. This is all grass-fed farming. This is high-quality produce. We're a significant producer of beef and chicken in the Southern Hemisphere. In Australia, we're the largest exporter of citrus fruit from the farm gate to, chi to, to China and we also grow various other crops across three aggregations in Australia. One thing I'm particularly interested in and delighted that these gentlemen are here to change the mood of a, uh, of a uh, primary uh, agricultural business uh, into the technology realm is my investments in technology. Uh, I also run something called the British Innovation Fund. We invest into spin-outs of UK universities. And the very first investment we made was into a uh, an institution called the Roslin Institute in Edinburgh, Scotland, one of the largest animal genetics businesses in the world. And consequently, we have a significant interest in producing medicines and efficient production of protein through genetic science. And uh, we 
uh, we have expanded that footprint into a number of other areas, including uh, compostable packaging uh, and other sources of protein that we grow efficiently in various countries around the world. Great. Thank you for sort of kicking off that uh, um, uh, thought about how technology actually is going to help us uh, get to that goal. So each of you gentlemen are leveraging technology in a very um, central way, actually, in what you're doing, and would love to hear about your particular take on the role of technology um, in what you're doing. Um, let's start with Sky. Certainly. Um, I, I think to the food challenge you talked about of 70% more food needed on a flat to declining resource base and one that's dramatically affected by climate change. Uh, one of the great uh, uh, challenges of climate change will be food production because increasing the world's temperature and decreasing water availability and irregular weather patterns dramatically impacts agriculture. So. We solve that by bringing it indoors, right? We control the environment, and, and so controlled environment ag as an industry in its many forms is one of the tools that will help to address this challenge, both addressing water and, of course, addressing food production in an unpredictable or increasingly challenging climate environment. The way we do that specifically at Peer Harvest is we have integrated a number of different climate systems from around the world. Uh, we source technology from Holland, the United States, and then we integrate that into one central climate management computer that then enables us to control the farm from a central terminal. And it's semi-automated using what's called the Mollier diagram. It's a diagram of, of, of essentially fluid dynamics. This Mollier diagram can take inputs from like our sensors that say how much light or how much heat or how much humidity. And then it, through a series of templates, we're able to then adjust the greenhouse. So for instance, open or close doors, um, uh, use a high pressure fogging system, mechanical or evaporative cooling systems. And in doing that, we can perfectly manip manipulate the weather inside the greenhouse, replicating the ideal climate for a specific crop, right? And that's fundamentally what we're doing. And once you give the climate uh, or the crop the perfect climate, and of course, nutrients and water, um, you're, we're also then dosing CO2. We actually eat CO2 and so we're, we're really carbon negative. We not only consume CO2 inside the greenhouse, we displace the airplane that otherwise would have flown the food here, right? What's interesting about that, though, is that what's good for the world is good for our cost structure, right? When we consume CO2 and we don't use pesticides, we use beneficial insects, a different form of technology. We're actually using predator insects inside the greenhouse to kill the bad ones that get in rather than spraying pesticides, right? So we're using all of these different systems together uh, to control climate in this unique place, right? And now we believe what we've done is transferable around the world, right? There are other places in the world that suffer from heat and humidity. Even where I'm from in Arizona, uh, it's a major lettuce producer for America, like California, but they're running out of water. Uh, so lettuce will not continue in Arizona for 20 years. They just can't. There's no water. So they need to bring it indoors or they're going to lose a big piece of their economy. We could be part of that solution. Awesome. Faisal? So uh, from our side, we know that, that food uh, uh, as a sector is, is lagging behind. It hasn't progressed as fast as, uh, as other sectors when it comes to technology. And we know that there are many companies that have done work to advance technology in food delivery or wastage management, uh, but little has been done to extract data on food purchases. Um, so the, 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 the thesis we have is that companies are tracking your heart rate, tracking your movement, but no one is tracking uh, food consumption nutrition yet, uh, because most payments are fragmented or cash-based still. But we believe that as the world goes uh, cashless, uh, there will be the chance to pull data on nutrition consumption uh, to advise people on what they should be eating. So this whole concept of personalized um, nutrition. What we do right now with schools is that we're able, to, uh, because we take canteens cashless, we're able to look at the food purchasing behavior of students and compare it to the standard. Uh, because school canteen is usually regulated uh, by, the, by the government, we're able to compare uh, what each student has eaten in terms of the key macronutrients, whether it's protein, fiber, or carbs, with the standard. The question for us then becomes, uh, how can we leverage this data to incentivize students to make healthier food choices? Uh, so that's how currently we incorporate technology to improve the nutrition in schools. 
You know, it's interesting because um, we're kind of down the, the, the chain from you guys in retail. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that people definitely are looking to eat healthier and they're looking for that advice. And if we're able to see exactly, if they're able to see exactly how that food that they're consuming is impacting um, you know, their health and so on, we're able to also make uh, recommendations as mm -hmm. to what they could buy or what they should buy without really having to read all the details in those labels, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, Simon, is there anything you'd like to add from uh, from a technology perspective as to... I know you had a, a very interesting story when we spoke earlier about um, insects, since Sky was talking about um, insects. Would you like to share that? Yuck, insects. <laughs> uh, look, uh, this is a fascinating uh, topic of conversation, but it crosses so many different boundaries. We're going into climate change, we're going into food nutrition, we're going into water management around the globe. Um, all of those things are absolutely essential to the way we think about investing uh, and um, are encompassed by our portfolio of investments. So um, we, we think that climate change is a, is a tremendous challenge, obviously, and it's going to impact the ability of the planet to meet the requirements to feed this, this vast number of people that are, uh, that are growing, and they're growing in the developing world. They're not growing in the Western world, in the United States and Western Europe. Uh, we don't pr reproduce uh, at the pace that uh, perhaps uh, is in any way comparable with that of the developing world, where population is growing very, very rapidly. And there are other things at play, such as the change in their diet. They want to consume more protein. And one of the great challenges we have is producing protein. And at the very heart of that is producing feedstock. It's not really about producing the cow or the pig or the chicken. It's about producing the feedstock that we need to feed these and the conversion rates at which we turn feedstock that we grow largely in the Amazon. Uh, we're tearing down rainforests. We all know about that. That's impacting climate change. Uh, to grow soy that we then ship at vast costs and with a huge environmental footprint across the world to places where they feed animals, uh, where the demand from people who are moving from the countryside into an urban lifestyle uh, is uh, predicating, predicated on consuming more of a Western-style diet. And um, one of the answers could be insects. Uh, we happen to have invested into this institute that I mentioned earlier called Roslyn, uh, where we set up a commercialization vehicle. This is an organization that since 1960 has produced more IP than Stanford, MIT, or any other organization in the world, pound for pound, buck per buck. Uh, it, is a, it is a prolific scientific organization, and it happens to have developed the six lines of black soldier flies that are commonly used for the production of insect protein. 30% of the world's population eat insects. We think of it in the Western world as something that seems rather unpleasant. But when you see the pulverized larvae of a black soldier fly, it looks very similar to fish meal or chicken meal that is produced from soy or any other kind of crop. And, and we believe that this is a localized industry What's fascinating about Sky's business is it's a job creation, localized business that doesn't have the carbon footprint of, of uh, shipping uh, produce across the world. And we believe that in Southeast Asia, where we're building this business, insect protein will become a, a, a tremendously important business. Uh, so yes, we, we are investing into it. Awesome, thank you for um, explaining that in more detail. Ellie, hi. Hi, guys. I, I'm good thing I'm not a technology investor. We had the time wrong in the calendar, so I apologize about that. Thank okay, you for letting so me join. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. <laughs> um, I'm Ellie Rubenstein, co founder and CEO of Manitree Partners. Um, we are a healthy food uh, supply chain investment firm focused on companies that have glo global distribution, um, that have revenue, uh, low profile. Um, usually founder-owned companies, as well as um, ones that have a completely 100% transparent supply chain. Awesome. So one of the things you guys have uh, in your prospectus or, or, um, is that you are 100% focused on investing in the health of the food supply chain. So just wanted to touch a little bit, actually across, across the board, on the concept of health. Um, you started with a personal story when we spoke um, about why you, know, you, you got into this in the first place. We'd love to hear a little bit about that and then how you really think 
we can move the needle um, to healthier nutrition in that supply chain. Sure. So I, I'd love to ask a question to the audience. Um, one of the first things when I think about health and maybe using food as medicine or improving your health, how many people here, I'm guessing, know their doctors and dentists, right? Okay. How many people know their farmers, fishermen, or ranchers that are supplying your food? That's the problem. One, and a woman, of course. <laughs> That's the biggest problem today, is that farmers, ranchers, and fishermen are not trying to harm you, but there's a mismatch of the data and the inputs of how they can grow your food in a healthy manner. Um, one of the reasons I learned that was personal. Um, I, my last name's Rubenstein. I, I do have a 100% Ashkenazi Jewish background with a lot of Jewish allergies, um, and it was kind of an issue from the beginning. Um, I also had a ski accident where I did have a traumatic brain injury and I really couldn't eat. Um, and so you get pretty creative and my family was very supportive, but it opened my eyes to the possibilities of using food as medicine. When medicine isn't an option, what else can you do? Um, and so that has always been a personal passion of mine. I am somebody that sources all of my own protein, so fish and meat. Um, and it really did teach me about um, where your food comes from, how it should be processed, and how you can lower the levels of histamine within your food um, and control you know, I would say the food poisoning, the food antibodies that are actually what's really causing a lot of the allergies in the food world today. So it is personal, and as I've been very open about this to many people around the world, I've been so surprised, I sh shouldn't be, of how many people have had similar stories. Many people use food um, when they have a health accident and then they change their diet. Um, many people also have had, whether it's allergies or some other issues within their family um, where they haven't had many other alternative therapies um, is possible. In the U.S. today, 50% of people actually would rather try food or go to their local grocery store or, or um, I guess, drugstore than going to the doctors. So I think it's, many people are trying to figure it out, and I think that the more that people are willing to, you know, use their bodies to figure out what works for them personalized, um, not all foods work for certain people, and so I'm just a big fan of people learning their own bodies and taking charge of their health. So one of the things that, um that, that tends to be um, sort of a, a point for debate is um, if you're really going to know your former, um, you're talking about some, you know, excuse the pun, small fries here, local players, can't really scale, so on. What would you say about that? Actually, that's one of the great things of innovation happening in the food space today. So um, several of our companies are really pioneering in the using blockchain traceability um, so that you can have a QR code and when you are in the grocery store, you can use your phone and scan it and you know exactly where your egg came from, what time, what farm, and you can learn your farmer. So I think that you're going to start to see a lot of innovation within storytelling uh, matching what consumers want in terms of information. So, um, you know, we love of keeping small farms. I know Donald Trump it maybe doesn't think uh, you know, in the U.S. You know, small farms should exist. What we would say is let, let's make it go back to small scale agriculture production and then grow the operating businesses where you can give them the, the scale that allows for the processing, the distribution, and the, and the consumer brands. So I, I think that farming, fishing, ranching is actually a great income source for families today. There's um, the fastest growing population entering that is actually young women, believe it or not, as a means to um, have income for their families and feed their families. That's a great point, actually, when, um, when we talk about the economic impact of, uh, you know, uh, the efforts to improve the food value chain. Sky, you and I spoke about, um, actually, you spoke at an event once and talked about how you can uh, drive world um, uh, peace and prosperity through tomatoes. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, <laughs> that was, uh, it's funny you caught that story. We, I was at, uh, speaking at the Wharton Social Impact Investor Conference in America, and nobody cared to hear about uh, fresh produce at that conference, so I titled my speech, Peace in the Middle East Through Tomatoes, <laughs> and, uh, and then every, filled the room, as everybody had to understand why. But the narrative on that, and I think bringing it to this region, and maybe to the point Ellie was making about availability of fresh produce and alternatives, of healthier alternatives for people, this region has a pretty dire situation coming. When we, when we talked about uh, food security and we talked about that 70% more food, nobody ever double clicks on where that is, right? There, America and, and parts of Europe are net exporters. Um, this region, we import over 90% of our fresh produce, and over, across the entire calorie pyramid, we're importing over 80%. The challenge of, of, of that, right, is that we, can't, we don't have a domestic production capability 
that uh, can, be, can serve year-round, and climate's part of that, but also uh, maybe some uh, poor policy decisions in the past that uh, with subsidies and the value chains in possibly the wrong places that led to some very bad behavior and some very bad uh, economics. That said, um, when I talked about the problem uh, in this region of this importing, we are exporting our oil wealth and importing food, and th but we also benefit from using that oil wealth to fix our currency. And in a post-peak oil demand world, which I think most of the world accepts at this point, it's a question of when, you're gonna have two things happening in this region. You have a very fast-growing population, one of the fastest-growing populations in the world, doubling about every 25 years, but with, which has more food need heavily reliant on imports and using that oil wealth to peg its currency in a global de dollar-denominated food market. Well, right as the wealth is falling, and they're fighting to diversify the economy here, you're going to have food, get, food prices getting more expensive in nominal terms. So this region will be one of the most challenging places in the world to feed in, the, in light of those macro uh, dynamics. And when I said peace in the Middle East, that's what I was talking about, that if we invest in food production capacity now, well, there's an abundance of capital in this region, the population is more manageable than it will be when it doubles, um, we can actually change that. And the last piece on that, and where I think it's really appealing to the governments here, right, and I have a direct conversation with the a Minister of State of Future Food Security, who I think really gets this, uh, is that um, when you invest in domestic food production, you, get, you benefit every piece of the national income identity, right? The formula of GDP is consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus net exports equals GDP. We increase consumption with availability of fresh produce, and, and that consumption is here. And not just produce, in all the other pieces, uh, pieces of the food chain. We attract foreign direct investment in, in, in this industry, and it's highly capital intensive, so lots of capital deployment, projects, construction, etc. Government, we actually rent land from the government and we're working on a partnership to try and buy their CO2, right? They waste CO2 into the air. We, we turn that into a raw material input, which only drives up our yields and creates a utility in what is otherwise a greenhouse gas being uh, dumped by industrial flue gas emitters like uh, the power companies and the water and the desalination companies. And then lastly, net exports, the big one. We're exporting billions of dollars and importing billions of dollars of food, and if, we're, if we uh, consume that here, we can drive tremendous economic transformation. And that's where I think what's exciting about the industry that we're all in, right, is that it's food security, it's water conservation, economic diversification, and sustainability, which is one tool, which is deploying tech to improve the food production systems. I'd love to comment on that. Um, so I got my double master's at Purdue in agriculture economics and my MBA in food and agribusiness. And on day one, um, they gave us a report of how do you feed the world by 2050. And I thought, okay, this sounds good. Um, but what I learned from that, and their lesson was on day one, was, we're, and, I, and I mean this, we're not actually running out of food. The problem is, is there's a mismatch of where the production of the food is and where the need is. And I think that sky statistics are great, is the mismatch of imports and exports. Um, food is a global trade system, and unless the trade system functions correctly, it, it doesn't work. I think a great example is actually beef in the US. Um, I know that some, some of it is controversial. I don't think it should be a, as much. And I think when you look at um, U.S. beef, it actually takes two to three years for a farmer to get money from that because that is what the call it production cycle is of a cow. Um, and mainly it has to do with, I would say, grazing conditions in the U.S. and sunlight. Um, Texas is probably is the most favorable due to sunlight. But if you go down to Uruguay, where they have year-round sunlight and open pastures, they're actually getting four times the amount of production in beef. And they don't use hormones, um, and they're not also putting feed in, in the animals. And so if you go back to the history of what U.S. You know, beef production did, we started injecting a lot of hormones into our beef so that we could scale it to mass production and then start exporting our beef. And it's, it's somewhat of an anomaly. It's like, well, wait a second, what do we do? Why are we doing that? You're just injecting an animal. You're making it more harmful for the animal, for the environment, and for the health because it's requiring more water as well. If you can use an animal for regenerative agriculture practices, meaning that the animal actually helps the land um, and is giving you a better quality product, then that's very advantageous. Um, I know there's been a lot of interest on the plant-based sector, but I always remind people there are still people that eat meat. And the plant-based sector today is actually only growing 8.9%. The premier beef and meat category is growing 41%. And the reason is that 
the statistics show that most people, after they might try an Impossible Burger Beyond Meat, 80% of people would rather have a real piece of steak or meat that they know is not bad for the environment, is good for their health, and they know exactly where it came from. So I, I would say as you go into 2020, start looking at what's going to go on in the beef industry, because beef is going to have the same renaissance that plant-based just had. Awesome. Um would like to kind of touch upon regulation. We, we spoke about it kind of in the peripheries, but, but I actually think it's, it's central. It shapes the whole, uh, you know, food industrial complex, so to speak, to a great extent. Um, so uh, any thoughts as to what, if you were in a decision-making um, position, uh, you would want to see in terms of regulation in order to fix the food chain? I, I would like to pick up sure. on one interesting point. Um, this concept of provenance of food is, is enormously important. I don't know if anybody saw this uh, report recently, but we produce, over the last 30 years, our consumption of plastic has increased by 47 times. Uh, most of that plastic, 80% of it, is completely uh, replaceable. It's not required in our lives. And only 7% of the plastic that is uh, recycled or sent away for recycling by the Western world to places like Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and so on, actually gets recycled. Most of it is burnt locally. Uh, some of it, high quality, is sorted, but very little of it is actually recycled. So you have this notion that you're putting this stuff into your recycling bins, and off it goes, and it's being recycled by some smart guy in the US. But in reality, it goes off to Indonesia. This report showed that actually the plastic that is going to these big dumps is passing into the food chain. And in Indonesian eggs, which were being exported into Southeast Asia, there were 70 times the safe level of toxins uh, in the eggs that were being produced there, because these chickens eat the pieces of plastic, uh, and, and that passes through into the food that you consume. So safe feed and safe food stock is as important as the provenance of the, uh, uh, of the animal. Um, we, we have a project, which is a fascinating project, uh, came out of a plant science institute in the UK called Rothamsted, called uh, Lemna. Lemna is, a, is, is what we would probably commonly think of as duckweed. You may remember as a kid in a science experiment in the biology class dropping a little piece of this uh, asexually reproducing weed into, uh, into water, and it will fill a petri dish in a, in a week. It, it reproduces at a rate which means that it is 90% more efficient than soy uh, as a source of protein. And it has the same level of protein as soybeans, which, of course, we tear down the Amazon to grow, and we ship across the world to China to convert into the soy milk that we put into our coffee. The reality is that we need to find alternative sources to uh, the feedstock issue in the world. That is one of the greatest challenges. And that is ultimately going to be the solution to much of the issues surrounding climate and climate change. Because we cannot destroy the lungs of the earth by continuing to tear it down to produce food. So, But is this something that, that should be left um, entirely to sort of the, uh, the, the market? Um, or should governments and regulation have something to do with it? If, if it's that dire, then you know, somebody needs to put pedal to the metal, so to speak. It's way beyond the challenge of governments. This is about marshalling and moving the $100 trillion of institutional capital out there into investing into the things that are going to make the changes. We have to encourage people to recognize that this is a form of impact investing, which is an area where you can make money, but an area where you can do good by the planet. I'd love to expand on that. In the US today, I would say food is where the internet was 15 years ago. Mike Milken has said that as well. Um, and so what that means is that I would say government regulations are not keeping up with the pace of innovation. Um, to your point about feedstock, one of the best sources actually for feedstock would be what the word that's called now food upcycling. It's not food waste. Um, it's, it's actually using food on the sell-by date or the expired date and put it to use. So it's a really a full circular economy. Um, you can use it for feedstocks. You can 
can use it as an energy source. Um, in the U.S., that has actually uh, made it more burdensome because that means that something that has to be regulated by the FDA, the USDA, and the EPA. So it's actually not that easy. There's been a lot of great startups trying to do it, but the regulation hurdle has been far more challenging. Um, and so that would be one thing I would say is that I think if people could work with their government and share knowledge, um, that would actually help us all because I think in Beyond Meat and Impossible Burgers, if you go back to the early days, um, one of the reasons Impossible Burgers uh, sales could not grow is that the, what the ingredient they used to make the burger bleed is something called heme, which was not actually approved for human consumption. Um, and so these agencies are doing their best, but they can only do so much with the knowledge I think that we all share. And, and the other thing on your environment one, I would say you're, there's probably going to be a new category that emerges in terms of labeling. Many people are used to or, um, organic. I think you're going to see something that's now environmentally friendly. There's so much of an issue right now in agriculture for using you know, the world's scarcest resources, um, and that is a movement that's starting to take action. Um, if I could add on that, I, I think that that's an interesting uh, a segue on the government. I get scared when we think of governments getting involved, and historically, that like ag is one of the most uh, uh, subsidized industries that dramatically impacts global trade flows and dramatically impacts uh, bad behavior, uh, right, within within the microeconomics of production in any given country. So, I think that uh, what governments need to do, including this one, which is endeavoring to do it, is to make to make it visible and clear the process. You know, if I want a power transformer upgrade, how do I get it done? What will energy prices be to this industry? And let us know, because these are multi tens or hundreds of millions of capital investments in food production systems. And you need visibility and certainty, not necessarily subsidy. In fact, ideally not at all. Um, but the other one is there's a lot of misinformation happening in in, uh, within uh, people leveraging their government to protect their interests. Let me give an example in organics, one of the most ab abusive uh, industries uh, is or organic farming. And an example in Europe, right, uh, or to be organic by European certification standards, you have to be growing in soil. Growing in soil is proven, A, it has nothing to do with whether you're organic, right? You can grow in an organic cocoa peat, the shavings of a coconut, is that not organic? But then if you're growing in hydroponics, you are banned from being organic. Mm -hmm. As a result, um, the, that's protectionism. It's these farms protecting their interests, the consumers losing, Certainly, you're losing on price, right? Around the world, organics tip typically get a 20 to 30 percent premium. Often, proper organic farming is actually cheaper than traditional farming. And certainly, when you go into controlled environment ag, we're better than organic. In USDA standards, we can be organic, just not in European. And countries adopt different standards. And, and I'll pick on organic on one more thing. Most people, 94 percent of people believe organic means no pesticide. It isn't true. It has lots of pesticides. It just has organic approved pesticides. This kind of misinformation is where I get scared with governments getting involved. Somebody will wield the government toward its own interests. I want the information to be readily available. And I think the bigger problem is, is, uh, was mentioned uh, is, is capital. Right? There, uh, I'm, I'll pick on Japan. Four trillion of capital sitting in these banks in a deflationary economy with a declining population. Investing in bellies where they're growing around the world would be a good idea. I don't know where all that money is, and why is it not investing in kind of consumer staples industries around the world, if not even just for impact, but for economics, for, for returns? I really don't know what they're doing with all the money. And so this is an industry that would make a ton of sense for them to be investing in. Thank you, sir. Well, we're, we've got five minutes to go, and I think at this point uh, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions. If, uh, if anybody is um, interested, uh, just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Um. Hi, uh, great panel. A question about food security, you touched on it earlier. When does it make sense, when does it not make sense where food security just fundamentally or commercially um, isn't viable? Um, I don't, so El Mirai is one of the largest dairy uh, farms in the world, it's number six. Uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so when, when, when do you have to kind of balance the commercial justification with the food security or the national food security of a, of a country? If I could tackle this one, I, I was part of a, a kind of a think tank effort with the Minister of State of Future Food Security on exactly that topic of defi defining what food security means for a given nation. And their definition, which they centered on, was ultimately about uh, uh, healthy, nutritious food being available to everyone at all times, right? Uh, roughly. And that seems pretty fair. 
That, to me, though, should be the guiding principle for where these subsidies and things exist. So, for instance, what you mentioned on, on cattle, um, it, I don't believe that it is needed to have a domestic milk production industry because certain perishables or, or certain uh, uh, goods within the food chain or within the calorie pyramid are more fungible and can be transported and stored differently. So, so I've been asked many times, hey, we, we do, you know, essentially uh, fresh produce, everything in the kind of the vegetable piece of the calorie pyramid, right? Tomato, capsicum, cucumber, aubergine, strawberry, lettuce, microgreens, herbs. We don't do corn. And people say, well, why don't you? Well, fundamentally, corn is really water intensive and it can be ground, stored, siloed, and shipped in a huge tanker, right? Therefore, the transportation economics of corn are very, very cheap, or the value to weight ratio in shipping. That tells me, economics should tell you that corn should not be produced here. It's too, the water is too valuable, and the good is too readily accessible in a different format. And we can, we can have entire silos of three months of corn supply supported by a government food security initiative, right? So it isn't about a national security issue either. Uh, milks and powdered milks and, and other things uh, would, would make a lot of sense as well. They should be sourced elsewhere. But things like strawberries uh, or, or berries, if that's part of your diet, should not be uh, shipped from Australia and flown here, right? Which is what's happening. Uh, about 65% of our berries come from California and Australia, which is crazy. You make um, a very important point, a very interesting point, uh, given that Salic have just made uh, a landmark investment into Western Australian wheat. They, they put a huge sum of money into buying wheat farms. In 20 years' time, Western Australia could be one of the only wheat exporting regions in the world, given the requirements of the domestic markets in many parts of the world and the inefficiencies and the water issues in the United States. The eastern seaboard of Australia can't afford to uh, export anything anymore. So Salik have recognized this and have, have deployed. And those issues about keeping everything close to home uh, have clearly been rethought through. You know, one more thing. Today in the U.S., um, there is a rule that's now being enforced under the Trump administration, which is that if a natural resource is uh, owned uh, more than 70 percent by a foreign owner, they must divest. So actually, there's a very large seafood uh, deal happening on the buyout market because of that rule. And I think that if you want to solve food security, it's far faster to figure out how to, how to share the information and knowledge of the innovative companies today in production regions of the world. So that they could actually start learning some of the techniques themselves. And so if you go back to the days of when a computer cost $10,000, same thing with a cell phone, eventually those prices do come down and then they can scale globally. So you definitely do want to pay attention to where innovation, I mean, Israel is a great example for food tech. They've actually solved plant-based far faster than the U.S. did, but it, the light isn't shined on that. I think why the U.S. is in the eyes right now is that we have both production, agriculture, and innovation and are willing to distribute that globally. So it's more about global innovation um, sharing, and you know, that would be what, I, I, what we try to encourage the most. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you taking the time, and um, we enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.